So hi, so welcome everybody. Thank you very much for your attendance today. Um, this webinar is part of the Energy Innovation Emporium 2021 webinar series, which is being organised by ETP, which is the Energy Research Pool in Scotland, in partnership with Research Innovation Scotland, which is a research pool led initiative which focuses on cross disciplinary and cross cutting activity with a challenge led focus. And you can find out more about Research Innovation Scotland and also about the whole webinar series that's being run by ETP um, at the link there and I will pop these in the chat throughout today. So again, thank you all very much for attending today's session. Today's session is being organised by SALSA, so um, in partnership with Zero Waste Scotland, the University of Edinburgh, and we also have representation from ENOUGH, who are previously 3FIO. So SALSA is the University Life Science Research Pool, and we drive collaboration across the universities in Scotland, across disciplines and across sectors. And the webinar that we have for you today is titled Sustainable Biotechnology and Synthetic Biology to Engineer a More Circular Economy. I'll try saying that really fast. And the real aim of today is to try and showcase the Scottish research that's applying synthetic biology and biotechnology to help reach global climate change targets. So we have a great lineup of speakers for you today. If you have any questions throughout the session today, we do have Q&A panel sessions within this hour and 15 minute uh, webinar. So please do put your questions in the chat, put them in at any time, and we can put these to the speakers once their kind of sections have finished. So the first part of the webinar is really going to cover the innovative academic research that's happening in this field in Scotland and also overseas. And we have some great academic speakers, Dr. Stephen Wallace, who is here from the University of Edinburgh and is a UKRI Future Leaders Fellow. Also from the University of Edinburgh, we have Louise Horsfall, who is Chair of Sustainable Biotechnology. Professor Dietard Matanovic from the University of Natural Resources and Life Sciences in Vienna. And to kick us off today, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Andrew Miller, who is a Fellow of the, Research of the Royal Society, Chief Scientific Advisor for Environment, Natural Resources and Agriculture for the Scottish Government, and Professor of Systems Biology at the School of Biological Scientists, Sciences at the University of Edinburgh. So he's very busy. So we're really grateful that he is here with us today. So please, um, I will stop sharing my screen and jump off camera for you, to Andrew. Thank you very Thank much you. indeed, Alison. Uh, welcome everybody. Thanks to Salsa for organizing this really interesting and, and timely session. So you've seen that the title of the webinar series is uh, uh, regarding energy and sustainable a sustainable energy system and of course biological inputs can indeed provide fuel that's one of the topics of a later webinar in October on biofuels but biology already feeds us clothes us heals us and houses us for some of us to reach a sustainable economy we need to keep doing all of that but now to do so in a regenerative fashion, recycling the resources that we're using. And those resources, of course, include combined carbon. Some of that's going to be uh, our topic among the topics of the speakers today. Now, biology, the activity in the world rather than the science, has been doing that for billions of years. Since photosynthetic organisms captured uh, a lot of carbon from the atmosphere and brought it down into the biosphere. In the past 50 years, biology, the science discipline, has been investing in understanding those biological processes and developing the tools and technologies to engineer them. Here in Scotland, we have a broad array of expertise in the underlying biological technologies in the uh, uh, specific domains required in the chemistry, in the engineering for scaling up, and in the organizations that link those different types of activities, such as iBioIC, one of SFC's innovation uh, centers. Now, the Scottish Government's Circular Economy Bill uh, is still awaited because it was delayed by the, uh, uh, by the pandemic. But we nonetheless have coming up a major UKRI, so a UK research funding initiative 
called engineering biology, which is just getting going. And that is one of the areas where I think we'll show that this area of biotechnology is becoming a general purpose technology. What you're going to hear today are just vignettes of uh, the example areas of application in what will become one of the cornerstones of a regenerative economy for a net zero society. So here in Scotland, there is a, a, a useful example of some of the, the scale of ambition that this area can have, which is the Grangemouth Industrial Cluster. Green in Grangemouth is going to be a very visible example of uh, the, the scale of ambition that we need in order to achieve a sustainable circular economy. So with that, uh, uh, I look forward very much to hearing what our individual speakers have to offer in the particular areas they're going to be talking about, starting off next with Dr. Stephen Wallace from the University of Edinburgh. Stephen. Uh, Stephen, you're on mute if you Somebody had to do that, right. Um, yeah, thanks, Andrew. Um, I'll just share this with you all now. Can you see that okay? Yep, absolutely. Great. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Hi. It's really great to have the opportunity to talk at such an interesting event this afternoon. Um, so my name is Stephen Wallace. I'm a, I'm a UKRI Future Leaders Fellow here at the University of Edinburgh. And um, I'd like to talk to you today primarily about petrochemicals um, in the short amount of time that I have available, unfortunately. Um, so by petrochemicals, what I mean is small molecules, um, both fine and platform chemicals that we derive from fossil fuels currently by industrial processes, as Andrew just introduced, that we have great um, sort, of, um, sort of facilities for here in Scotland. Um, and I think if we're going to be discussing this afternoon ways in which we can move away from the use of fossil fuel based feedstocks to meet these really ambitious carbon emission targets that we have by, by 2045. I think it's also important to sit back just for a minute or two and to sort of process the enormity of the challenge that, that, that lies ahead of us. And that primarily is because petrochemicals are pretty much entrenched in every aspect of our modern day lives. Um, we use and we consume and we wear petrochemicals pretty much every day and I guarantee the majority of you have, have probably used petrochemicals at some point today from the materials we wear, the materials that, that, that build our houses to the pharmaceuticals that we use to, to, to uh, sort of promote our, our health. However, as I'm sure everyone here is aware, the manufacturing processes that we use to make these petrochemicals are quite frankly unacceptable. Um, to give you some examples, in, in 2019, chemical manufacture released over 30 million tonnes of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere in Europe alone. And in the UK, this equates to around about 20% of total energy demand and around 30% of all industrial carbon dioxide emissions. And this puts petrochemical manufacture second only to the um, transportation industry in terms of the carbon emissions that it emits. To put this in a, in a, in a bit of a wider context than that even, um, since you know, really sort of petrochemical industrial activity took off in the 1960s, um, just 20 companies have released over 480 trillion tonnes of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And 19 of these 20 companies manufacture petrochemicals. And even beyond that, despite all the sustainability initiatives that we've had over the past 20 to 25 years, the chemical industry is the only sector whose reliance on fossil fuels is currently increasing. So there's clearly a lot of work to do if we are to, to even come close to, to achieving these, these environmental and carbon emission targets in the future. So beyond even the carbon emissions of these industrial processes, the problem actually is a little bit wider than that. Um, fossil fuels themselves are running out. Um, the carbon that we're pumping into the atmosphere is having an irreparable damage um, to our planet's climate. And um, the environmental legacy of these um, activities um, is reducing biodiversity on Earth. And you know, one fact that came to light, uh, someone told me recently that actually I find quite distressing, is the idea that the byproducts of these industrial activities, and I mean by this um, plastic waste, um, is actually starting to, to sediment on geological surfaces. 
And geologists actually think that a layer of plastic waste within rock sediments is going to be used for future generations as a biomarker for the time that we live in now. So we're going to be defined by the waste that we're generating from current industrial pro processes. And I, I find that quite unacceptable. So, so it's all these sort of um, motivations and facts that really drive my research here in Edinburgh. Um, into the use of modern biotechnology to sort of mitigate against all these damaging effects of current industrial processes. So how can we change this and, and can this actually make a difference? Um, and the emerging technology that really has inspired me as a, as a self-confessed petrochemist by training, um, and the reason why I came to Edinburgh and Scotland more generally to do this research is, is the strength that we have here in modern synthetic biology. And this sort of realization that the, the exact same chemistry that we use to make these petrochemicals can be encoded into a sequence of DNA. And this designer DNA, as we call it, can be used to program living cells to make these molecules for us. And instead of using petrochemical based feedstocks, what we can do now is we can ferment sort of sustainable based materials such as carbohydrates um, to produce these um, industrial chemicals in, in a very mild and very sustainable way. And I guess more so in, in the context of today's seminar, um, what this also enables us to do is to enter into more circular economy models where the waste generated from one industrial process can serve as a carbon resource um, from which um, sort of higher value chemicals can be derived in subsequent biological processes. And this extends in sort of a third dimension as well, where you can think of valorization in terms of taking waste carbon and actually adding value to it by creating new higher value, higher value small molecules. So can we actually make a difference? Um, I, I think the short answer to that is yes. Um, so I'm giving you here just um, as carbon emission data, global carbon emission data um, over the past um, almost 50 years. Um, and by and large, since climate change initiatives started in the early 1990s, you can see here that we've never really been able to deviate from this sort of upward trend in terms of carbon emissions. That is until the last couple of years and specifically the last two years where you can see carbon emissions have dropped quite significantly. And that is, of course, the, the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic in terms of reduced travel. Um, so if anything positive can come for the last 18 months, you know, let it be this, and that is that drastic changes do make a difference. If we dramatically change the way that we lead our lives, both, both personally and industrially, we can reverse the effects of, of, of global uh, sort of carbon emissions and climate change. So in the couple of minutes that I have left, um, I want to take you through one specific example that we've been sort of developing in my lab here in Edinburgh over the past three years. And that is in the sustainable biomanufacture of this small molecule here, it's called adipic acid. Um, for those of you who've perhaps never heard of adipic acid before, I guarantee that well, you're most probably in contact with it right now, um, because adipic acid is used amongst many applications um, in the manufacture of nylon polymer um, to make materials such as clothing, um, but also building materials, food materials, and actually as an additive in many pharmaceutical formulations. And as such, it's produced on over 2 million tonnes industrially every year and has a growing annual market demand in the US alone of over $6 billion. However, as you can perhaps predict, um, the industrial process that we use to make adipic acid is, is inherently reliant on fossil fuel-based feedstocks um, via a process um, that emits incredibly high amounts of, of nitrous oxide emissions. And nitrous oxide is a, is a greenhouse gas similar to carbon dioxide, but in it's um, sort of 300 times more potent than carbon dioxide. And actually it's been found that eight to 12% of all human associated nitrous oxide emissions worldwide come from this one singular industrial process. Um, and to put that in a bit more context, that's equivalent to the carbon emissions that come from every single vehicle on the road in the UK today, twice over. Um, so by creating a new biological and sustainable manufacturing route to atypic acid, we have the opportunity here to create a sort of positive environmental change that is equivalent to electrifying every vehicle in the UK twice over. 
so sort of motivated by 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 these facts and um, my group here started um, a project a couple of years ago now on on sort of whether we could program laboratory bacteria to produce atypic acid from more sustainable feedstocks and the feedstock that we focused on was this here the small molecule called guaiacol which is the major component of of craft lignin and lignin is a, is a, is a renewable uh, natural resource that um, is primarily a component of plant cell walls but is also produced as an industrial byproduct from the agricultural and um, paper milling industries to name just a few and is widely thought of to be one of the most sort of untapped sources of carbon on earth and what we found very recently is by taking four enzymes from various sources around nature and combining them um, in this um, sort of bacterial overexpression plasmids, what we've been able to do is program E. coli and to optimize a bioprocess uh, quite, quite extensively actually um, to give us um, a, a strain of bacteria that can effectively process guaiacol into atypic acid in over 90% conversion. Um, and this process occurs in a single flask, it occurs in water, it occurs at room temperature, and it occurs in under 24 hours. Um, and we published this paper last year, which I direct you to if you want to read more details about this. Um, however, sort of um, the take home messages really from this bioprocess currently is that um, the single byproduct that comes from this reaction, from the demethylation of glycol here, is formaldehyde, which actually is an incredibly reactive and quite problematic byproduct when released on an industrial scale. When you do this chemistry inside of a living bacterium, native metabolic processes actually process formaldehyde and therefore remove it from the reaction. So you can see in this color metric screen here, in the presence of the fully engineered bacteria and substrate glycol, we see no detection of formaldehyde. Whereas you do when you add um, formaldehyde in the presence of dead cells, i.e. the metabolites not processed. So by sort of conducting this chemistry in a designer microbe, we effectively remove all byproducts from this biotransformation. And critically, we don't release any carbon dioxide whatsoever. And even more importantly than that, we don't release any nitrous oxide from this process, um, which, is, which is great. We think a really positive step forward. So just, um, I wanted to give a really quick acknowledgement to, you know, the amazing group of scientists that I get to work with every day in Edinburgh, albeit not in person right now. Um, and particularly Jack Souter, who's a final year PhD student in my lab here, is funded by the Carnegie Trust, which is a superb organisation that funds and promotes basic scientific research in Scotland. Um, and Dr. Joanna Sadler, who is a BBSRC fellow in my group right now, who's recently taken a similar approach to processing plastic waste in, in designer bacteria to produce flavouring compounds, including vanillin. Um, and I direct you to this paper here if you'd like to read more details about this science. So um, that's pretty much everything for me. Um, I think I'm going to pass on to Louise now and I'll take any questions at the end. Thank you very much, Steve. Just sharing my screen. Um, okay, here we go. All right. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yes, I'm going to jump right in with uh, some stats as well. Uh, if it lets me. Right, okay. So, um, Scotland has uh, given itself the target of net zero emissions by 2045. And as was, was mentioned, road transportation is an incredibly uh, important part of, of, of this reduction. It's currently responsible for 20% of carbon dioxide and 14% of greenhouse gas emissions worldwide. And it's something that can be replaced with electrification and have a significant reduction because the technology is there and ready. The sale of petrol and diesel cars is going to be phased out in the UK by 2030. And that means that until recently, my calculations, um, there was less than one in 200 cars that, that was zero emission battery electric. But by 2050, that's going to have to be nine in 10. So it's not just the UK that's setting itself these targets. The, it, it's worldwide. So the demand for lithium ion batteries um, will grow exponentially over the next few years. Um, 
this the graph on the on the left shows us um, really how how important uh, the contribution of passenger electric cars is going to be uh, that increase and of course that increase that's going to happen is also going to have an increasing demand for the components of lithium ion battery and um, that's majorly going to fall on critical metals which are cobalt and lithium so cobalt is already and, and lithium recently have been uh, classified as critical metals and cobalt's going to have to the demand over a 15 year period is going to increase 37 fold and lithium 18 fold um, so it's really quite a huge increase that um, we're going to see in the demand for these materials. So that means that we're going to have to move away from our current linear economy when it comes to lithium ion batteries. We cannot have, there, there just isn't the material available to, to meet that demand. We're going to have to move away from this take make throw away society and move to a more circular economy now you might have seen the circular economy um, visualized before as as this butterfly diagram where you have the biological cycles on on one side and the technical cycles on the other but with synthetic biology we have the opportunity for a lot of those technical cycles to be bio-based or bioprocess based and I think that's very important. That's, that's what's going to help us realize the potential of synthetic biology. You see, there's a bio-revolution coming. It's been proposed um, by the McKinsey Global Institute that as much as 60% of the physical inputs to the global economy could be produced biologically. And that's around one third of these inputs of, of biological materials, but the remaining two thirds are not biological materials, but could in principle be produced using innovative biological processes. I think one of these biological processes that we could harness is the natural nanoparticle biosynthesis that's a metal tolerance or detoxification process undertaken by plants, fungi and bacteria. And then using bacteria, using synthetic biology to harness this process could help us to address the loss of metal as waste from a variety of different processes. And it gives us advantages over current processes of nanoparticle synthesis in that it allows us to use impure feedstocks, has lower production and energy costs, less hazardous byproducts, um, novel and high value products and the bacteria themselves are reus reusable as catalysts. So I'm going to take you through a couple of examples we've been working in, in the lab um, that illustrate this, starting with copper and silver nanoparticles. So we've been using Morganella cyclotolerance to be able to produce copper and silver nanoparticles for a while now. We've shown that with regards to the copper, we can actually use impure feedstocks, including distillery byproduct to be able to produce these copper nanoparticles. The product itself, the nano, certainly the copper ones, um, is arguably novel because it's stabilised and doesn't oxidise for months um, because of the biological process by which it's formed or the stabilisation factor um, which is present in the, the environment in which it's formed. So we've been studying this process, um, looking at the proteins that are responsible um, for being able to produce the nanoparticles. And when we start manipulating the, the quantities of these within a cell, we can actually increase the yield of nanoparticles quite significantly. But not only that, what we've also shown is that you increase the, the the number of smaller nanoparticles. So not just the yield that you can measure as, as the metal nanoparticle, but actually um, also we're increasing the number of smaller ones, which are actually the more valuable, the more useful nanoparticles. And we're investigating these as antimicrobial agents. Already um, a, a critical and, and a high value product is palladium and platinum. 
We've also been working with these metals and using desulfovibrial ascensis to be able to change the size of the nanoparticles to aid their recovery. What we've then gone on to do is some simple um, catalysis where we've been able to show that while perhaps this one down here, which is an ionic liquid, it's um, silver in solution, is, is catalytic, um, that homogeneous catalyst um, gets washed away and can't be reused, whereas the nanoparticle catalysts um, can be used several times over because they're heterogeneous catalysts and they also don't contaminate or risk contaminating the product. So a more industrially relevant reaction that we've been looking at is the Suzuki coupling reaction. And we've also shown that um, if these nanoparticles are um, synthesized biogenically, then when we compare the palladium nanoparticles to chemically synthesized nanoparticles, um, they're far more catalytic at 37 degrees C and in water, so in, in much more benign conditions. And we can add um, certain uh, ligands and additives that increase the yields um, of product even further. So the only, um, the, the the product yields that we're seeing are comparable to these homogeneous, to homogeneous catalysts of, of palladium ions. But again, as I said, this can contaminate the um, product and can also not be reused, whereas the, the nanoparticles when attached to cells can be. So that's, that's the um, starting point uh, where we came to the, the lithium ion battery problem from, that there's definitely potential to be able to use nanoparticles um, when they're formed biologically. And um, we can, we've already seen that we can manipulate um, some of the mechanisms of being able to produce them. So as part of the Faraday Institution and a collaboration that stretches across the UK, um, we've been working to see if we can selectively recover um, metals from lithium ion battery leachates. And um, we've been given a number of leachates to work with. Um, it depends on the, the concentration of the acid and the type of acid, mineral acid, organic acid, as to um, the composition of the metals that are within the leachate that we're given. So we've been working with, as I said, real battery leachate, which is quite hard to come by. These are from a Nissan leaf. And um, separately, we've already shown that the bacteria that we're using, um, we can produce nanostructures or nanoparticles of manganese, of aluminium, of cobalt and of nickel when these are dealt with in separate solutions. So then moving to the complex mixture, what we've been able to show more recently is that um, with a first treatment, uh, we've got three different types of leachate here. Um, one that's very um, concentrated in, in the manganese, very high in manganese content, we can recover um, selectively the manganese in a first treatment with the potential to be treated a second time and hopefully that, that would work later. Um, with a slightly different leachate type, again, we've got selective manganese recovery with just a little bit remaining um, and uh, the, the other metals untouched. And then with the leachate, a third type of leachate, which is um, more of a mixed leachate, we can selectively recover the manganese greater than 90% of it, um, leaving uh, cobalt, lithium and nickel um, to be treated in a second treatment. And that um, we've, we've then done, and we've been able to recover selectively the cobalt and the nickel together, um, leaving just the lithium. So the lithium itself in, in this form could be precipitated in the normal way that lithium is precipitated and, and then used. Um, we've also supplied our collaborators with the manganese um, and nickel from, from uh, leachates for them to be able to see if they can reuse, reuse in cathode material. And we've also shown that there is potential to scale up this process by showing that the bacterial fermentation and first treatment process can be scaled up to 22 litres 
um, which we've done with the iBioIC. But there is a number of opportunities that we need to take for synthetic biology to help us actually realise this as, as a potential um, treatment process so that we can recover this material and, and reuse it. We need to be able to use synthetic biology to tailor the nanoparticle properties for their reuse. So that um, we've, we've done this, for example, with the platinum na nanoparticles, but we need to be able to do this with each of, of the metals within leachate. We also need to improve the metal removal and nanoparticle synthesis capabilities that these bacteria have. Um, we have some um, promising results in that we've been able to show that engineered strains at the higher concentrations are able to recover cobalt more efficiently. So there is potential there and we'll continue with this line of work. We're looking at um, identifying the proteins that are conferring the metal resistance and the nanoparticle synthesis and how we can manipulate those individually particularly because we not only want to characterize the pathways involved but also because we want to capitalize on the metal specificity and selectivity of bacterial systems and um, we have seen through our proteomic studies that there is a cellular difference in the response to the nickel and the cobalt so there's definitely um, the potential to be able to harness that selectivity um, to be able to recover in, in separate processes, the cobalt, um, which is the most critical metal, um, and the nickel, which is still at quite a at-risk category. So um, in summary, the, the microbes, um, microbes are amazing, um, and synthetic biology is providing us with the means by which we can repurpose microbes for our own ends. But we shouldn't limit their potential because of the limits to our current knowledge. Um, that's particularly when it comes to metals, um, there's a lot of unknowns. We need to work beyond traditional disciplines uh, to understand both the need and the application to which we want to use these bacteria for, but with the diversity of microbes that exist, and by using synthetic biology, we might just have the tools needed to reach net zero emissions by 2045. Um, obviously that is totally in line with the other speakers here because actually the transportation itself won't be enough to, to reach that goal. So I'll um, thank my group um, and the funders and I will pass over to Detard um, to speak on the uh, carbon dioxide use. Thank you very much, Louise. Uh, let me share my slides with you. So, yeah, uh, many thanks for inviting me to, to be part of this uh, exciting event. Uh, uh, we've heard a lot already about uh, um, microbial biotechnology and its benefits uh, for a sustainable future. And that's also what uh, is driving our research. So we, we think a lot about how uh, microbes and microbial biotechnology may contribute to saving the planet. This is of course a bit a blunt statement, but uh, as we heard uh, in the previous talks, uh, there is huge potential um, of, of microbial processes and uh, the, the new uh, uh, lines, uh, development lines uh, based on synthetic biology uh, in a couple of, of uh, lines that yeah, are kind of uh, outlined here. So uh, on using of different uh, feedstocks like lignocellulose, green chemistry, uh, as we have heard, uh, providing novel routes uh, for production of, of uh, uh, chemicals that uh, surround us, uh, clean up of waste that 
that uh, we have made uh, and we have seen this example of plastic waste that is kind of covering the planet um, biological nitrogen fixation and uh, recycling of, of metals for instance as Luis just has uh, uh, wonderfully introduced uh, and last but not least carbon capture and utilization uh, is among the the options and possibilities that microbial biotechnology offer us. Uh, so I want to refer you to this uh, uh, very nice uh, review by Victor De Lorenzo, who summarized kind of, uh, yeah, the seven top microbial uh, processes that may help uh, to save the planet. And among these, uh, on the top, actually, he's listing uh, non-photosynthetic CO2 capture pathways. And this is very much where uh, more recently our research is uh, engaged. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, to kind of uh, shape uh, the topic, I would like to introduce you briefly to green methanol. Um, what is green methanol? Uh, traditionally, methanol uh, is made uh, from mainly from methane gas, from fossil uh, gas resources by oxidation of methane to methanol. But uh, green methanol is taking a different route, uh, actually, by reducing CO2, uh, for instance, from industrial emissions, uh, concentrating and reducing the CO2 uh, to uh, single carbon chemicals like formic acid, methanol, and methane. Uh, in principle, all these three are potential substrates in microbial processes. Uh, and uh, of these, methanol is particularly useful in biotechnology. It's energy rich, much more uh, richer in energy than formic acid. Uh, it is liquid by itself and it's water miscible. Um, so that makes benefits also uh, above uh, methane. Uh, and uh, as a bottom line, nature has uh, evolved pathways uh, to utilize methanol. Uh, several bacterial species and uh, yeast species can use methanol. Uh, and these could be uh, like chassis organisms for methanol-based bioproduction. And this can be uh, either biomass, I have put here yeast biomass uh, as a, let's say a yeast person, of course, I'm biased a bit in that respect, uh, but uh, especially intended for food and feed uh, purposes, uh, yeast uh, is, is well uh, uh, used and known in this field. Uh, and the other option is uh, to produce commodity chemicals uh, from this uh, green methanol. Uh, so let me introduce you briefly to uh, methanol utilizing yeasts, and especially to this uh, species here, Comagatella puffy, uh, or Pichia pastoris, as it's often known. Uh, it is one of the so-called methylotrophic yeasts. Uh, this is a group of yeast uh, species that uh, uh, can utilize methanol as energy source and carbon source. And to use it as carbon source, that means uh, the yeast needs to close each and every carbon-carbon bond uh, of its growing biomass uh, uh, from uh, methanol, because methanol uh, is, is single carbon, it has no carbon-carbon bonds. Uh, and to do that, uh, the yeasts have developed a very efficient pathway, which is called the excitolose 5-phosphate cycle. Uh, what we found a few years ago is that this entire cellulose 5-phosphate cycle is compartmentalized in the so-called peroxisomes. So if you look at this uh, 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 electron micrograph, you see here that when growing on methanol, the yeast uh, fills itself with uh, such huge peroxisomes, and it's actually filled up with all the enzymes that are responsible for this cyclic pathway to assimilate methanol. Um, now, what was uh, striking once we have uh, uh, clarified the pathway in all details uh, that it is 
highly similar to the well-known Calvin cycle or uh, Calvin uh, Besham cycle, as it's it's known today. Uh, uh, which, for instance, plants or some bacteria are using uh, to assimilate CO2. And actually, methanol and CO2 as single carbon molecules, of course, share uh, quite some uh, similarity, so to say, as potential carbon sources. So um, what we can state as a bottom line, uh, uh, the yeast is able to assimilate methanol and to make all these carbon-carbon bonds, uh, and the pathway is compartmentalized. And this, uh, we speculate, uh, probably increases the efficiency of the pathway. Now, looking at the methanol pathway and the CO2 pathway uh, of plants, uh, we see quite some uh, overlap. So uh, there are five shared biochemical reactions, and this prompted us to, to uh, assume or, or, or evaluate whether we can use uh, the yeast peroxisomes as kind of a pathway chassis uh, for a synthetic Calvin cycle. So kind of turning the methanol cycle into a CO2 cycle. And uh, in a nutshell, uh, uh, this is how the pathways look like. So it's, it looks quite complex. Uh, the, the methanol cycle, three methanol molecules are used uh, in essentially three different cyclic reactions, which indi are indicated here to finally yield one uh, carbon three molecule for biomass growth. And similarly, for CO2 assimilation, one, uh, three CO2 molecules are entering three cycles and uh, uh, yielding one. Uh, C3 molecule for biomass growth. Uh, and uh, this is uh, an illustration of uh, uh, our, uh, say, synthetic strains uh, that we have developed essentially by deleting three native genes and adding four uh, heterologous genes uh, uh, by use of synthetic biology tools. Uh, uh, we could turn this methanol cycle into uh, a Calvin cycle uh, using other enzymes from, from other yeast species and a plant and a bacterial enzyme to close the Calvin cycle. So essentially, uh, yeah, this is uh, the, the outline and that was kind of the, the blueprint or uh, the description of the PhD thesis of Thomas Gassler who uh, did all this uh, pathway engineering and uh, uh, it turned out that uh, yes, the concept worked. So uh, what we see here is growth curves uh, in bioreactors of uh, these uh, <clears throat> engineered cells and you see that they all grow very similarly uh, and uh, if we repeat uh, the growth from here, take samples here and re inoculate bioreactors, we can repeat the same over and over again. Uh, the blue line is a negative control with an interrupted Calvin cycle, so this should not grow and it cannot grow uh, using CO2 uh, carbon dioxide as the only carbon source. Uh, growth uh, at this stage was quite low, so with uh, uh, laboratory evolution, we could increase the growth rate and you can see here the increased growth of the, the evolved strains uh, that led to kind of uh, uh, about the doubling of, of the growth rate. Okay, so uh, this uh, was quite exciting by itself um, uh, to enable autotrophic growth in a heterotrophic uh, microorganism. Uh, but um, that triggered, of course, the question whether we can make chemicals from CO2 by uh, metabolic engineering. Uh, and uh, I would just use a minute or two uh, to introduce uh, what we are currently working on. So we are uh, evaluating two chemicals, lactic acid and itaconic acid as potential products from CO2. Uh, they are interesting because they are uh, possible precursor molecules for uh, polymers, for, for plastic materials, uh, 
so kind of bio-based uh, plastics. Uh, and uh, uh, to summarize very quickly, to make itaconic acid in principle, we need one enzyme uh, uh, from the, the native pathway uh, and another a transporter uh, protein. And by adding the gene for the enzyme, um, <clears throat> uh, uh, we get uh, uh, already a good uh, amount of uh, itaconic acid in a range of, as you see here, about uh, 400 milligrams per liter based on CO2. And when the transporter comes into play, uh, the amount can nearly double. Uh, and by some uh, process uh, uh, optimization, now we are in a range of nearly two grams per liter that we can make from CO2 as uh, the, the starting carbon source. Uh, so this, this is where we are. And uh, uh, conclusion A is that uh, we have been able to turn uh, this uh, P. Here pastoris or K. puffy into a chemo organo autotrophic organism. So a heterotroph into an autotroph. Uh, uh, and uh, what we are working on now in, in two follow-up projects is uh, uh, to explore alternative energy sources beyond methanol, which we are using now, and uh, to produce biomass or chemicals, mainly uh, that's the, the content of these projects, uh, based on CO2. So that's either on one side in the Austrian Center of Industrial Biotechnology and in a newly started Horizon 2020 project named Vivaldi. And with this, I want to thank uh, all the people involved uh, and the funders of that research and uh, all the members of our Institute of Microbiology and Microbial Biotechnology. So with this, uh, I thank you for your attention and uh, hand over from here by stopping my screen share. Thank you, Dietard. So uh, I, have, I think uh, our host is having some technical connection problems. Uh, so if the speakers would like to turn on their uh, uh, video cameras just for the next, uh, Q and A session. Um, we'll we'll go straight to questions. So, uh, in the interest of time, I'm just going to proceed straight ahead. Anybody from the audience who'd like to ask, ask a question, please put them in the chat, and we'll ensure that they get uh, asked to the speakers. If you can direct your uh, question to a particular speaker, obviously that's very helpful. Uh, so, the first question is for Stephen. I think you'll probably have seen it in in the chat, Stephen. Uh, from Rachel working at Census, how long is it likely to take before your adipic acid process becomes commercialized and then becomes the major source of adipic, adipic acid? I guess she means worldwide. Yeah, it's quite a prolific question, right? Um, uh, yeah, we, we're very much at the early stages of this research at the moment. We're sitting at around about one gram per liter of production right now. But since um, publishing this, I guess, initial proof of concept study last year, we've had an enormous amount of industrial interests. And in fact, we're, we're applying to lead a very large sort of commercialization endeavor in this area, hopefully starting next year, um, which will do exactly as you, you suggest. It will enable us to assess the commercial potential and scale up of this process towards perhaps achieving what you suggest, although that does sound uh, a reasonable way off yet, but yeah, we're we're we're, we're doing that um, a number of years yet, but it's on our radar. Thank you. Uh, we'll just follow up with a second one uh, for Stephen, which I think has come from uh, Amanda Ingram, if I understand correctly. Uh, it's about the sourcing of the lignin, which is your feedstock. Um, so, what volume uh, would be required for that scale-up process? Can it come from the byproduct of another process? So, what volume would it be taken from the byproduct? Yeah. Um, so, in sort, of, I, I mentioned the guaiacol substrate that we use as the as this the substrate for this this bioprocess is the major component of craft lignin. And as far as I'm aware, there are no craft lignin plants in in the UK currently. So, we're working with a company in Germany currently 
um, who generate large quantities of craft lignin waste, um, of which around 60 to 70 percent, if I remember correctly, is guaiacol based. So the predominant um, fraction that comes from depolymerized craft lignin waste is what we want. Um, and the, the other byproducts that come from depolymerized craft lignin can be used in other microbial upcycling processes. So um, I think that sort of answers your question. The majority of what we get from craft lignin is what we want, but other small molecules can be diverted into other um, bioprocesses also. Thanks very much. I'm going to move on. Uh, I had a question for uh, Louise, which is about the form of the metal recovery for the various different metals that you discovered. The lithium in your battery leachate example is coming through in the remaining solution, if I understand correctly. Are all the others coming out as nanoparticles? Yeah, we can get nanoparticles on nano structures of all of them. They're not the they're not the pure metal. But the examples that I gave with the platinum and palladium, they're the, the pure metal in its zero valent form. Um, but with the the the, um, the manganese, the uh, cobalt, nickel, and uh, aluminium, they're they're in salt forms or carbonate forms or um, sulfur sulfides but um it's it's really about getting them in that selected manner and then processing them further right i see and i think there's another question here uh, which sounds like it's probably uh, also for you uh uh louise uh so have you considered the application of the recovery process i think you've just answered this would this be part of a combined mechanical and biological recycling process yeah absolutely so within the faraday institution project um, that's called relib um, what we're actually looking at what we're aiming to do is recover a hundred percent essentially of the the battery components at the moment um it's, well there isn't really a recycling process but it, it involves shredding and turning into black mass and then trying to treat it with, with everything mixed in whereas this project is actually trying to automate um, the safe disassembly of lithium ion batteries there's a mechanical process that's been patented by my colleagues in Leicester that strips the aluminium off so it's not actually even there in the leachate that we're getting anymore um, and then the is uh, it could be a chemical leaching or it could actually be a biological leaching process that we can then take that leachate from so it's combining yeah mechanical chemical physical all different processes so that we can actually recover all the different components in a usable form of the lithium-ion batteries great thank you um so uh uh, a last question, I think, for, for Louise here is on processing of manganese, which uh, the question is saying, Alan is saying, that is also a key component of sodium ion batteries. Is there any scope uh, to look at the recovery from sodium battery leachates? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, that's the, certainly our uh, precipitation mechanisms that we're looking at they're they're kind of the leachate agnostic in that we will work with what we're given and um i would imagine that the sodium ion batteries um it, it's likely that a lot of the components are, are still going to be quite similar um and since it's the lithium that we can't precipitate anyway sodium i you know it's it's presumably would would follow along quite similarly. Um, and so uh, uh, lastly, I, I had a question for Professor Matanovich. So Dieter, uh, uh, you're used to using atmospheric concentrations of CO2, is that correct? Uh, we, we are mostly working with higher concentrations. I was a bit short on that, sorry. So five to 10%, uh, they can grow on atmospheric concentrations also but growth is is really slow then yeah okay right Th thank you very much indeed um so uh, uh thank you uh, to all our speakers from the first session we're now going to move on from uh our, our first session to uh, uh uh amanda ingram for zero waste scotland uh, uh who has pre-recorded a talk uh and then uh 
to uh, Jennifer Smith from Enough. Uh, so I'll hand over now to Ali, who's going to show uh, the video for Amanda's talk. Thanks so much, Andrew. I have got really bad Wi-Fi issues. I'm really sorry, everybody. Um, Jennifer, would you be able to share Amanda's uh, talk for me? And then if uh, Craig, you can come on after Amanda and then we can get some questions for the both of you. But Jennifer, are you able to share your screen and, and share Amanda's talk for me, please? I don't trust my Wi-Fi to do it. Yeah, I'll just get this playing now. Thanks so much. And then once it's finished, Craig, if you just want to jump on and do your presentation, that'd be lovely. And then we'll do questions afterwards. Thank you, Andrew, so much for stepping in there. So Jennifer, there's no sound on that, um, so that's not working. So um, I think you need to do it from downloaded. Have you, do you have it downloaded to be able to share it straight from the player? Yeah, I did, but I wasn't able to share. Oops. Okay. Mm. Sorry, everybody, just bear with us for a second. Um, if not, what we could do is uh, we could hear from you first, Craig, if that would be, if you'd be ready, and then we can we can do, once we're ready, we should give us a bit of time to set up for Amanda then. Would that work? That's fine, yeah. Um, yeah? Okay, great. Thank you very much. We can see that. Great, Craig. Thanks. If you're just going to screen. Um, presentation and then we can see it's still in. that's it perfect thank you thanks everyone and uh, thanks to salsa for the for the invitation i'm really just literally in the door from my uh, cycling holiday around isla uh jura and collinsy and I actually gave a good chance to you know reflect you know on some aspects of the of the circular economy and also um fermentation uh processes that uh, that we visited um, so I'm going to cover um, a little bit about the story of Enough. Some people may know um, the company as uh, 3F Bio. Um, we rebranded um, a couple of months ago. So I'm going to give you a little, little bit of the story um, really from our inception in uh, 2012 um, and just go through um, our, our story. So it's all about making uh, protein uh, sustainable. And, you know, we changed the branding to Enough because the you know, we need to be able to feed uh, feed the planet and uh, current uh, farming uh, methods are unsustainable. Um, so this is a little bit of the of the of the background. So if I, you know, in June, um, we concluded a 42 million euro series B, uh, which is fantastic, which will allow us to build um, our first uh, full scale um, facility. Um, but looking looking back, we started doing some of the initial uh, lab work at Strathclyde University in Sibs in uh, 2012, um, filed our initial patent in uh, 2014 through the university, um, and the company um, itself was founded in uh, in 2015. We had really good support, um, you know, at that time through IBIC, through Scottish Enterpri Enterprise, um, and also um, working with Amanda and the team at uh, Zero Waste uh, Scotland. Um, really helped us uh, underpin uh, our technology. Um, we then uh, progressed through uh, Series A um, and also were very successful in a large European um, funding project, so a 17 million uh, project um, under Bio-Based Industries uh, joint undertaking. Um, so that will also go towards um, supporting the first uh, full-scale um, facility. Um, what we're planning to do over the next um, few years is grow our production to a million uh, tons so very um, you know very large you know sales growth and this would be through new um, facilities uh, globally um, in terms of the protein uh, market it's absolutely um, absolutely vast 
So in terms of um, you know, annual demand, something like 500 uh, million uh, tonnes. Um, this uh, chart here shows you know, the rise of different types of alternative uh, you know, proteins. Um, so we are a, a kind of plant-based uh, you know, protein based on fungi. We have microorganism-based and, and cell-based. And each of these will have a, a role to play over, over, current, um, over current years. But it's quite incredible if you look um, globally at the, at the requirement. So our first plant will be um, 10,000 tonnes. Um, but to cope with the, the demand for um, plant protein, you would need an initial 4,000 tonnes every single day over this, uh, over this time period. So a massive uh, you know, opportunity for a range of different uh, technologies. Um, so in terms of our, of our process, um, we use um, Fusarium venenatum, um, a continuous aerobic uh, fermentation. Um, so we can use a range of, uh, of substrates in terms of uh, sustainable sugars. Um, the actual product itself um, is the is the biomass which we which we harvest, and then the zero waste part of our process is that we recycle um, you know um, sugars, um, you know protein, water into a secondary process for manufacturing bioethanol. So that's the core of the of the patent, and then the material itself um, can be made into a broad uh, range of of food. So we have a pilot um, facility at Kenning Park, you know, in Glasgow, our HQ is in, in Glasgow. And um, we also have a chef um, there who's creating a, a wonderful range of, uh, of products. So you can see some of them um, here. So um, more and more of our products are, are vegan uh, rather than, you know, vegetarian. And it's a very versatile product that can, uh, that can, um, it comes as a, as a, as a dough, but with, um, you know, with flavors and other things can be made into a range of, of other um, types of uh, of, um, of protein, um, so the the material itself, um, unlike some of the other uh, you know proteins, has a texture um, to it in terms of the the, the high fat itself, and is you know very versatile and really a whole a whole food. Um, so the um, first plant we will be building is in the south of uh, south of the Netherlands. Um, this is a, a impression of the of the facility. We're in the detailed. Uh, engineering phase and just about to cut the first um, uh, foundations um, of that. If you look on the left hand side, um, so we're located on a, on a cargo um, site. So our plant is in the, in the middle there, um, but we, we take uh, feedstock um, directly from the, from the cargo um, facilities, so the glucose feedstock, um, and then we tie in our effluent, as I mentioned, in the, to the their ethanol um, facility. So it's a Excellent, you know, example of you know circular, uh, circular manufacture. So this um, plant will be operational um, second half of uh, next year, um, and as well as the the technical uh, you know aspects, we've been working very hard um, in terms of material from from Kenning Park to um, supply to customers, and you know these are a couple of the um, the commercial. Uh, opportunities that are in the public domain. So we have one with uh, Marks and Spencers, um, and also working, um, you know, with you know with Unilever. And a key aspect of Unilever is the sustainability, obviously, of the you know of the protein itself. Um, and we're doing detailed work on uh, life cycle um, analysis. Um, we're using the uh, same organism um, that's used by Marlow Foods for for corn. So in terms of um, being able to sell, you know, directly. With through EFSA and uh, FTA, then uh, that's um, you know progressing progressing very well. Um, we work uh, with uh, Good Food um, you know Institute, and you know some on the call will be more expert um, than myself here. But in terms of you know fermentation, um, we have different uh, types of fermentation. You know, in terms of either uh, the biomass in our case or functional uh, functional products, um, and the efficiency is uh, particularly particularly strong. So the doubling time um, in our process is between four and five hours. So it's a very um, productive um, process. And we also operate it continuously, which is a key part of the, um, the sustainability um, of the process. Um, there's a range of um, companies um, working either on functional proteins or, or biomass. And this is, this, these uh, lists are you know, growing um, you know, all the time. You know, and um, we've talked a little bit about one of the technologies here uh, earlier in the, in the in the seminar, but there's a whole range and companies growing, uh, you know, all the time. 
some of them focusing in one area, some of them focusing on a broader range. Um, in terms of the types of products, um, so meat alternatives is probably with the main uh, products. We also have some interesting meat hybrids. So this is mixing with, uh, you know, with, with meat um, and seafood, um, and then also into other areas, dairy applications, uh, ice cream, uh, pastas and noodles, uh, pet foods, et cetera. Um, and then through into um, cultured meat. So for example, you can use mycoprotein as a scaffold um, there, um, snacks. And we're also doing some work in, a, in uh, with some uh, plastics in terms of using microprotein with a French company called uh, Lactips. They normally use uh, whey protein. Um, some of the other proteins um, that um, you may be aware of that are, all have their place here. You know, uh, we've talked a little bit about cell base, but we also have pea, um, soya. Um, the insect uh, space is, uh, you know, is very interesting, algae. So some of these have um, pros and cons in terms of you know, taste and uh, texture. And there's our product, uh, product there. Um, so really just to um, conclude a key aspect for us, what if we made 1 million tons of our you know, product, that would be 5 million uh, less uh, cows in terms of intense animal farm or uh, 1.25 billion less chickens. And there's all sorts of different um, you know, benefits in terms of uh, water use, uh, you know, land use and, uh, and CO2. So really just a quick um, you know, whiz through um, an overview of, of the company created in Scotland and you know, growing to now be a uh, very scalable uh, global. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Craig. And um, thank you. So if we can have, um, so Sarah, are you gonna come on and share um, if you can stop sharing for me, Craig, that'd be great. Oh, no, there we go. Sarah's come on. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, there's no sound there, Sarah. Hi, thank you for the opportunity to join this event today. My name is Amanda Ingram and I manage our bioeconomy sector work within the Circular Economy Programme at CW Scotland. We are a not-for-profit environmental organisation funded by the Scottish Government and European Regional Development Fund. Zero Scotland exists to lead Scotland to use products and resources responsibly, focusing on where we can have the greatest impact on climate change. And using evidence and insight, our goal is to inform policy, motivate individuals and businesses to embrace the environmental, economic and social benefits of a circular economy through responsible consumption, responsible production and gaining maximum value from waste and energy. Um, we're working to create a widespread shift in thinking and activity across Scotland and beyond. Um, to move away from take, make, dispose model or um, of resource use that we're used to, whereby we dig, have been digging up finite materials, using them and then disposing of them at the end of their life. Often because the materials are, are designed in such a way or they're entangled in such a way that they, they can't be separated easily for even basic recycling. Um, and we want to disrupt this system and move towards a model where we redesign systems and products so resources are continuously recovered and they can be kept in circulation for as long as possible and also in as high a value as possible. And this will involve looking at how we can reduce our consumption and have responsible production to keep resources and materials in as high a value as possible and reduce the associated emissions. Um, it's important that we design things differently and design for disassembly at the end of life as well. Um, and that involves also looking at disentangling the biological and the technological uh, materials. So technical materials like metals can continue to be reused and recycled back into technical materials again and again. Um, whereas biological materials and nutrients can be used and reused and at the end of their life recycled safely back into the um, biosphere. 
My role at Zeroy Scotland is to support businesses to make this transition across the bioeconomy. And by that, I mean the parts of the economy that are using renewable biological resources from land and from sea and converting them into food, feed, materials, energy, etc., using bio-based technologies um, such as industrial biotechnology and the adoption of synthetic biology processes. Um, the bioeconomy is a major employer in Scotland and it's instrumental to economic activity both at the moment and um, for the future um, because it includes um, several of our iconic industries as well, um, including agriculture, whisky, um, fishing. Um, and as a result of this large scale activity that we have, the bioeconomy is also a major contributor of emissions, agriculture and land um, related land use. Um, is one of our most significant sources of CO2 emissions and I believe the second largest emitting sector in Scotland. Um, however, it is also going to be a major solution for reducing emissions um, as other sectors are very much looking at bio-based opportunities as a way to decarbonise. Um, for example, transport, construction, industrial processes, all looking to be replaced by bio-based ones. Um, to achieve Scotland's uh, net zero ambition, the bioeconomy must dramatically reduce its own emissions while simultaneously meeting the growing demand um, for biomass feedstock required to decarbonise other sectors. So essentially, we really need to look at decoupling the output from the impact, and that will require a transformation to a much more circular bioeconomy. So in the same way that the existing economy didn't happen um, without intervention and it has been designed, the same is true for the circular economy and the circular bioeconomy. It's all about redesigning the economy and we can't achieve that in isolation. It really needs a national and a, a global shift um, because we can't just look at one aspect of the cycle. We have to look at the whole value chain right through from the, the feedstock and the raw materials to the production and the processing to consumption and use and also to end of life. Um, and in the bioeconomy, for example, we need to look at designing for um, responsible production, looking at um, optimal growth and efficient use of resources to design out waste and emissions. We need to look at designing for responsible consumption. You know, how are we going to produce low carbon, high value products and processes which can, uh, can kind of compete with less sustainable linear products and processes. And so again, looking at designing out the waste and emissions associated. Um, but we also need to design to maximize the value of the, the waste and energy because there will still be leakages to the system. And it's these wastes and byproducts um, where Zero Waste Scotland have supported businesses to look at reducing the impact of these and adding value to these. And Zero Waste Scotland are driving this change um, to the way that we view materials by investing European regional development funds to stimulate innovation to help small and medium sized enterprises be resource efficient and enable a more circular economy. Um, we've got a wide range of support available to help drive this thinking and activity forward, which I want to just touch on today. For early stage projects, early stage projects um, that, that, that need support to develop their ideas into potentially scalable and commercial opportunities, we run one day Kickstarter workshops. And for projects that are a bit further developed, um, the Circular Economy Business Support Service is available for, for projects that are led by small and medium sized businesses, but they may also be working with academia, research, larger companies, etc. Um, and we provide specialist targeted support and guidance to help them further develop new business models and opportunities. And support has included several spin-off companies from Scottish universities in the past. Um, as part of that business support, um, we can also offer internships where a company will receive the support of an intern for up to three months to help um, really focus on a specific area of project. Um, and then through our circular economy business network, we have an opportunity there for, for businesses and other organisations um, working across all sectors 
to share their good practice, to collaborate and to learn from each other. And for projects which are sort of beyond the research and development stage, um, we also have a circular economy investment fund. And this is for capital and revenue funding of up to £1 million for a project. Um, projects need to be led by a small and medium sized enterprise, but they, they can and they very often do team up with companies or researchers or academia, as well as um, linking to international companies and markets as well. Um, projects need to be able to demonstrate that they are innovative, that they support a circular economy, that they create jobs, um, investment, and importantly, that they can achieve carbon savings. Um, and we also have a wide range of specialism and opportunities to support businesses across a number of specific sectors, um, and that can include larger companies as well. Um, I probably don't have time to discuss um, today um, all of these um, types of support. However, I'm very happy if you want to contact me and I can signpost you um, on the right person to contact about that. In my last two slides, I want to give you some examples of the types of projects that we support and fund. Um, the first is a piece of work we delivered for the benefit of businesses, organisations, researchers, academics working within or out with Scotland. Um, and this mapped for the first time the, the quantities, um, origins, characteristics of waste and byproducts of uh, biological origin that were arising in Scotland. And we found over 27 million tonnes of material were arising every year in Scotland, which could be used as a feedstock um, for biorefining or for other processes. Um, and it's this waste and byproduct element that Zero Scotland are particularly focused on. And the data that was gathered has proved um, already to be invaluable for a number of companies and organisations um, around the world who, um, because it's, it's highlighted the new opportunities for Scotland um, to be able to use these materials. Um, and then closer to home, this, the, some of the data from this report on agricultural crop residues has recently been used to deliver a fellowship project in partner with uh, partnership with Zero Scotland and Safari, the, the Scottish Environment Food Agriculture Research Institute, um, to take a more in-depth look at the high value opportunities for some of the agriculture residues. Um, and I also want to highlight a project that Zero Scotland are currently working on in partnership with the Scotch Whiskey Research Institute um, with I, uh, iBioSE, the Industrial Biotechnology Innovation Centre, and three um, small and medium sized businesses. Um, we're doing this to look at the possibility of not just diverting um, one byproduct to one new product, but looking at um, the possibility of a cascade approach. So several values can be taken um, from the same material without affecting the material for the next user um, in the chain. So in this case, we're looking at pot ale from uh, whiskey distillation. Um, many of the projects that we have supported to date have looked at taking a waste or a byproduct from one process and using it as a feedstock for another. Um, and there's, there's more information on this on our website, but to give you a quick summary of some examples, I want to tell you about um, Xanthella. They're a, a company based in Oban that we have supported through our Circular Economy Investment Fund to help develop their innovative process to use a whiskey co product um, and a renewable and surplus energy, along with LED lighting to grow algae, which can then be used for several high value applications, um, such as locally produced um, omega-3 oil, for use in, say, nutraceuticals or ingredients for fish feed. Um, we've supported Salucomp, a company based in Fife, through our Circular Economy Business Support Service. Um, this company have developed a, a green chemistry process to extract nanocellulose fibres from root vegetables, um, primarily from sugar beet, which is a, a byproduct of the sugar industry, and they can then be used in several applications such as paints and coatings to provide uh, a low energy renewable alternative to petrochemical based ingredients. Um, Ogilvy Spirits are based in Forfar and they've been supported by Zero Scotland through the development of a case study to showcase the opportunity that they have developed. 
Um, they found that due to variability in supermarket demand, surplus potatoes were being um, generated. So the company installed a distillery and then make a high value vodka, which they, they sell locally and also internationally. Um, and the byproducts of this process are then used as cattle feed or as kuzbus, I think, as they call it. Um, and then finally, um, just wanted to mention um, a company, 3FI, or we're now um, called Enough. Um, they're a biotechnology company specialising in sustainable protein, and they were funded by Zero Scotland to demonstrate at scale um, a new manufacturing technology to produce um, in bulk high protein uh, food, ethanol and animal feed using a zero waste um, fermentation process. So I hope that gives you a flavour um, of what we what we do. Um, thank you very much for your time. And um, if you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you, Amanda. Um, so if I could invite Craig and Amanda to put their uh, video cameras back on and anybody in the audience to uh, pose further questions for either or both of them uh, in the chat uh, where we haven't uh, had any yet. So everybody, please do. Um, uh, chip in. So, uh, uh, Amanda, the report that you uh, just mentioned on um, the uh, 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 waste feedstocks for for refining, um, I notice you know, that that includes uh, uh, an element of marine biomass, which wouldn't count as as um, waste exactly, but but harvestable uh, seaweed, which has been a bit of a, uh, a sensitive subject, but obviously. You know, Scotland has far more sea area than uh, land area, and the pressures on our land area are growing really, really significantly. I just wondered whether uh, the uh, uh, SME sector that you interact with in Scotland uh, remains interested in that uh, marine sector. Hi, um, yeah, uh, so I suppose the first thing to, to note is in that report that I mentioned, the uh, biorefining potential for Scotland. One of the one of the materials that we didn't include in that report were well, two of them were forestry and uh, macroalgae or seaweed and that type of materials. So we actually are, are in the process of um, adding that data now. So that just just for anyone who's who's looking at that, at that for that type of information, that's going to be sort of added this year. Um, but yeah, we we definitely um, have a lot of companies who are interested in in that material both. Uh, either who have been harvesting wild seaweed for different applications or um, some organizations who are looking at, you know, kind of se uh, seeding for seaweed or that type of thing for either for food or for the application using the um, extracting the alginates or the um, cellulose for different um, production of different materials to replace, you know, traditionally fossil fuel based materials so yeah there, there's a lot of interest I think in some cases there maybe isn't enough um you know seaweed at the moment so so that's why some of the companies are looking at you know alternative species that can be can be seeded and grown yeah. you know, um, either either at sea or, or grown in on land mm -hmm. yes right um super uh we have a question here for Craig um could you elaborate more on the motivations behind mixed meat products? I guess the, the motivations for enough to engage in producing them. Um, hi, yes. Yeah, so, sorry, the video is not allowing me to put the video on. But um, so that is is one um, opportunity. So you, what you have is in the market, you have lots of meat companies who are looking at um, moving into alternative uh you know, an alternative protein, and they can either do that by having a you know 100% uh, you know plant-based, or some of them are looking at um, you know like a, a mix, and it really is as simple as you know you could have a 50-50 mix of plant-based and, and meat in, in mince, um, so that you would have you know some of the same uh, you know kind of taste, um, some of the you know the benefits I guess for the consumer. Um, I would say it's, it's a relatively small part of our um, you know of our portfolio. But it is an interesting, you know, interesting, you know, an interesting, you know, aspect. And what we have seen though in the last, 
you know, certainly probably in the last couple of years, um, you know, the, the rise of um, almost essential to have vegan, uh, you know, material. So, so historically, uh, corn has used egg as a binder and actually, you know, in terms of formulating product, you know, it, there's quite a lot of technical challenges in terms of removing, you know, egg. And we've done a lot of work in the last, uh, you know, couple of years, um, but certainly having something that, you know, is vegan is almost now, uh, you know, essential. So I would say the dry is probably more, more that way rather than the kind mm-hmm. of hybrid you know the hybrid uh, you know meat um you know type approach and, and your products aren't using egg as a binder no so we we supply an intermediate so it's it's uh we supply okay. we're a b2b company so we work with a whole range of this different uh you know companies who will do their own you know formulation um mm-hmm. so we, we supply a supply an intermediate but, but in general most companies are are trying to have you know vegan products so uh, there's a follow-on question for that which uh, uh is just asking to uh, effort any follow-up on the nature of the fungus that you're using in the bioreactor it's the same one as for corn is that right it, it is so there's different um companies have different approaches so some of them are using you know different um strains you know different uh, fusarium strains um they have then to bring new products to market so we make to the decision you know earlier on to use the you know an existing uh, strain so you know as time moves on we may you know reconsider but there's basically two different approaches one is to use the existing strain and one is to use you know new strains so mm-hmm. we're, we're using an existing strain right yep fully understood and then the last question i think uh, in the interest of time we'll just uh, uh, i'll place to 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 each of you uh, uh, i'll start with craig to follow up and then come to amanda so the question is what's being done in communicating between producers and processors and in this case, so so Craig, uh, uh, this is a question for you as part of that B two B chain. Uh, and the context, uh, the question is context is if we need to rely on mixed resources and fluctuating resources, this can uh, wind up being a risky economy for the producing side. Yeah. So so there's no bio um, refinery in Scotland, which is primary reason why we don't have a facility in Scotland and their first facility will be in the you know, in the Netherlands and um, there's a kind of study underway looking uh, nationally at sugar beet you know and the potential for that to produce uh, you know bioethanol which would be which would be interesting for us we've also spoken with um, some of the whiskey uh, you know companies but in, ter- in terms of recycling <laughs> some of our material into you know into whiskey there's um, you know certainly challenges associated uh, you know with that probably perceived rather than um, you know, actual, uh, you know, technical challenges. So, so I think it is a, it is a, it is a challenge. Um, the bio, bio refineries in England have been closed. They're starting up again with E10, you know, tariffs. Mm-hmm. So the whole tariff aspect is, um, you know, is, is uh, difficult. So I think, I think simplistically you need to have a, you know, mixed, uh, you know, have, a, have make sure you have feedstock, you know, security perhaps across a greater range. Um, mm-hmm. Yep. So E10, the 10% supplementation of petrol for yeah. uh, uh, car fuel with bioethanol. Uh, Amanda could ask the same uh, for your perspective on that same question, the, the communicate communicating across the, uh, the value chain and to yeah. explain how, how this uh, newly designed economy that you've <laughs> talked about uh, is going to work for everyone. Yeah, well, um, we are working with um, lots of different sectors. Um, you know, we are, we are in discussions with the National Farmers Union for Scotland and um, Seafood Scotland, who represent um, fish processors, and there, there are many different sectors that kind of need to be in the discussion. And I'd say, you know, generally Scotland are still in those early stages. But I, I completely agree with with Craig that we are sort of, in some ways, you know, what we're kind of behind in, in a way because we don't have that large scale biorefining facility here in Scotland that can can deal with some of these uh, materials. And it's it's not even just for you know this sort of you know ambition to get to a circular economy it's also you know will be useful for um resource resilience and and for for dealing with seasonal changes that we have and you know when we have a good crop year and a and a, and a more difficult one or you know what we saw we saw difficulties in having materials and during um the pandemic as well so you know having having a facility where we can sort of store materials you know dry them freeze them have have them available for a variety of things is is going to be really useful and that there is a lot of discussion across Scotland about how that could um, be achieved, be it, you know, a, a central facility or, or um, mo- you know, mobile facility, however that, however that pan, pans out. But yeah, there's a lot of 
a lot of discussion ongoing with different sectors about what um, materials we will need in the future and, and, and in the current time while we transition to a more circular economy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, I, I put in the chat at the, at the start uh, a report from the Scottish Science Advisory Council uh, and one aspect of that on sustainable chemistry, one aspect of that is indeed this, this same issue of getting ref by refining capacity, mm -hmm. uh, not just resource streams, but by refining capacity, which can then uh, start to feed uh, some of the you know, many really interesting processes that the science base in Scotland uh, can uh, develop and explore. Uh, I'm going to leave the last question about COP26 uh, because I think we're, we're all quite quite clear that, that this is a great opportunity for Scotland and for the world, but not, not a simple one for everybody to address. And so as we're slightly uh, uh, over our previously advertised time slot, I'd like to call the session to a close by thanking all of the uh, speakers for their various contributions, the audience for, uh, for participating, uh, and to uh, Salsa and our colleagues in ETP for setting up this event and the uh, uh, seminar series as a whole. So thank you all. <laughs>